Alrighty. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the San Anselmo Library's virtual program today, Thinking of a Winter Garden, Grow Asian Greens. I'm Sariana, the Adult Services Librarian at the San Anselmo Library. And before we begin, I'd like to thank the Friends of the Library and the Library Parcel Tax for sponsoring this program and all library programs. Everyone will remain muted until the end of the presentation. If you have a question, please type it in the chat box and we'll answer all questions at the end of the presentation. We will also do a more traditional Q&A um, at the end of the presentation as well. Technology can be very fickle and I wanna thank you all in advance for your patience and understanding during this program. We are recording the presentation and I will send out the link later today. Our speakers today are Bonnie Marks and Mammy Yee. Bonnie Marks has been a Marin Master Gardener since 2017. She lives in San Rafael, where she grows edibles on hillside terraces and in raised containers. She has planted native plants in the areas surrounding the vegetable garden to attract pollinators and support biodiversity. Mammy He has been a Marin Master Gardener since 2017 in the same class as Bonnie. She grows vegetables in raised beds and berries and fruit trees in other parts of her garden. She also maintains a large native plant garden for its beauty and biodiversity. Please join me in welcoming Bonnie Marks and Mammy Yee. Woo! Only one clapping, but I'm sure everybody else is. Woo! Yay! And you ready for us to start screen sharing? Good. I didn't know if you were going to talk about future programs or so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I will say hello. And while I'm opening my screen, um, uh, Mamie's going to say uh, aloha, and you'll figure out where she is. Aloha from Maui. And uh, as Sariana mentioned, uh, Mamie and I are both Marin Master Gardeners. We uh, participated in uh, their training program in uh, 2017, we hadn't met each other before, but we uh, met through the training program and have done a number of projects together. And our most recent project was focused on growing Asian greens. And we'll make sure that the next feature. So some of you may know a lot about uh, Master Gardeners already. I think I saw some familiar names. So some of you may already be Master Gardeners. Uh, I had the privilege this morning of sitting in on the orientation session for the uh, Master Gardener class of 2022. There were uh, 49 people who are basically participating in a program where between January and May, they're going to be trained uh, about gardening and then be prepared to share their knowledge and skills with the public. The master gardeners are non-paid, i.e. we are all volunteers, uh, members of the UCCE, University of California Cooperative Extension. That's kind of a mouthful, but you see is the uh, houses houses the program uh, statewide here in California. And our primary goal is to really help folks with home horticulture by focusing on research-based information. So we are constantly learning new things and uh, preparing to help folks and handling questions about pest management, uh, sustainable landscapes, and uh, more recently, a real focus on earth-friendly gardening. So I'm gonna ask um, Sariana if you could mute. It looks like somebody came on and isn't muted. I'll let you handle that in the background. Well, it was actually, yeah, it was actually Mammy. So I will mute Mammy and she can unmute herself because she's, um, she's a host. Okay, so. I see somebody called, oh, I thought it was, okay. As long as, as long as she can unmute when it's, when it's her, her, her turn to talk. So I've skipped over slides too quickly. Yeah, it, I've, I've, um, she'll, she is marked as a co-host, so she'll be able to mute and unmute herself. Okay, good. So, and so I'm not sure what I pushed that I wound up going through so many slides, but let's go back up to where we were. Okay. This is called ignore the technical problems. So um, one of the best places to get information uh, for help right now, especially given COVID times is the website. So during the period starting in March of 2020, 
when we really couldn't provide services in person, uh, classes where folks could come and learn, uh, uh, classes like this one where normally we'd be in a library together uh, with you, uh, taking those online and then completely redoing our website. So we have a wonderful website. You can either Google Marin Master Gardeners and it gets you there, or if you just remember Marin MG, uh, you know, if you type that, Google will find you the rest of the way there. UCANR stands for University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources. Uh, but on our website, we have all kinds of information. So this is just a screenshot of our website for November. So you can see some of the kinds of things that we're focusing on, including sort of a planting guide for the current month. Uh, this is a great time to plant native plants, so we've got information as well about planting them and integrating them with your native garden. If you're here today, you, we know you're particularly interested in growing things that you can eat. So there is a section, these are the tabs on our website, and there is a huge section on edibles. You're seeing six of, I think there are 12 boxes on this page that have information about growing edibles with everything from how do you get started uh, to a really nice section of uh, choices of types of things to grow that do really well in the uh, Marin climate. So the edible section might be a first place you would want to go visit and explore. The help desk traditionally has been at the heart of Marine Master Gardeners and ordinarily you could take whatever plant you couldn't identify or dying specimen of a plant or something with bugs on it that you didn't know what they were and show up at the office in Nevada and a Marin Master Gardener would greet you, get information about where you're growing uh, this and you know, what your concerns are, and then help solve the problem, give you the information and work with, uh, if they couldn't solve it, work with our um, Steve Swain, our expert horticulturist who could help. However, because of COVID, the help desk isn't open. So we have taken it online and something new, uh, you can always email the help desk, but something new this year is there's actually a form. So if you go to the website on the help desk page and click on that, it'll pull up a form and you can describe exactly what your concern is and take some photos and attach them to an email and someone will get back to you. So that's been, uh, it's been a lifeline for gardeners throughout Marin. It's partly how I found out there was a Marin Master Gardener chapter when uh, I first moved to Marin eight years ago. The piece that is still in operation because it's outdoors and because uh, folks can be masked is our Marin friendly garden walks. And even though we've just had some really nice downpours of rain, including another, I think, quarter to a half an inch, depending uh, where, where you were living just in the past day and a half, um, Drought is a big concern. Drought hasn't gone away. Last year at this time, we've gotten some big rains in October and then November, December, completely dry. Uh, February, hardly any rain. And uh, I think folks have uh, seen with their own eyes how low our reservoirs are and the concerns that we have uh, going back to we better build, rebuild that pipeline. But in the meantime, there's a real interest to how do I make my garden more drought resistant? So you can set up an appointment. Again, I'm not sure anyone's answering the phone, but on the website, you can click on the link and request a garden walk and two master gardeners will set up an appointment with you, come to your home, look at your garden with an emphasis on saving water, but also uh, they're trained and can answer some of your questions about fire smart landscaping and what kind of plants you might switch to. So uh, this is uh, a great project and a chance to actually meet with and get direct help from a volunteer marine master gardener. 
So I'll come back to enough about Murray Master Gardeners. The commercial is over. Uh, and I'll come back to talking about growing Asian greens. Um, this is Mamie and I on Halloween. We dressed up as Asian vegetables in our hearts. Uh, she said she was the turnip, so I guess I had to be the cabbage. Uh, and here's what we're going to cover in our talk today. We're going to talk about why you might want to grow Asian greens. And then we're going to talk about some of the types to grow with an emphasis on the ones that we grew. My garden is in a sunny uh, hillside area of San Rafael and Mamie is out in Point Reyes. So we have different microclimates. Mine is more inland, hers is more coastal, uh, but we both, uh, both successfully were growing Asian greens during the same time periods, mostly successfully. We'll, uh, we'll share our lack of success as well because the best way to, uh, to learn something is to find out what went wrong and how you can avoid it in your garden. Uh, we'll get into some specifics about growing Asian greens and we'll even talk a little bit. We had a third partner who does hydroponic gardening. So Mamie will teach you a little bit about hydroponics and we'll share uh, some of what Vicki experienced growing hydroponic Asian greens. Uh, and then of course we have to talk a little bit about how you might want to cook them because after going through all that effort, you want to be sure you have something delicious to try. Uh, we'll also share information about where we sourced uh, the kinds of seeds that we planted. So with that, why would you want to grow Asian greens? Well, one of the best things in the Bay Area is that we have a mild enough climate that whereas it's uh, snowing or freezing in other parts of the country, we can actually be growing food in our garden. So, once summer is over, your tomatoes are done, the beans have dried up or been hit by frost, uh, the pepper and eggplant, uh, the same. Uh, you've got space in your garden to grow something. And Asian greens are a perfect way to fill that niche. They're fast growing. They're pretty easy to grow. You can seed them directly or put little plants in and be less worried about spacing than you would uh, with other things. And they grow well in containers. And much of the ones <clears throat> that I grew, I did grow in containers, large containers. So you can see in, in that picture, they're container grown. And uh, if not a container, even in small spaces, you can grow Asian greens. They don't take up a lot of space in your garden like some of the larger vegetables. Uh, Swiss chard plants are huge and need more ground around them unless you're just growing you know, the tiny baby ones for uh, you know, quick stir fries. Uh, their water needs are pretty low. You can pretty much grow them organically. They're very, don't have a lot of pests. Maybe we'll, we'll talk about that later also. So they're a successful crop for organic gardens and they are super nutritious. So how nutritious are they? We'll take a look at two. One is bok choy, uh, also called pak choy. And Mamie just told me today, uh, pak choy is actually how they're referred to in the UK. So mostly stores here refer to them as bok choy, but a lot of seed packets will also say pak choy. And only 12 calories in a half a cup of cooked bok choy, but you can see that they're super rich. I mean, 85% of your needs for vitamin A, close to half of your vitamin C, vitamin K. So full of vitamins and minerals. And another one that we grew was Mizuna, which a lot of folks use raw in salads as well as cooked. And again, uh, you know, look at the vitamin K in that one. I mean, you know, 348%. I think, I think that means if you're taking Coumadin, you probably don't want to, uh, to eat that one because uh, vitamin K is, uh, it helps with blood clotting. But uh, other, otherwise, it's, uh, it's got something you're really going to get a lot out of. So there's some nutrition information. Uh, the other thing, as I said, is you can grow it uh, twice a year. So you can do it as a fall winter crop seeded sometime in the early to late fall, 
or in the early spring before you're going to be getting your summer vegetables into the garden. So these two pictures, uh, the crop on the left was one that last year I planted in mid-September. Uh, the crop on the right was one that I planted in April. Uh, this year I was running behind, so um, I didn't get mine planted until um, I guess it was it was almost late October, so they're still pretty small, but I still anticipate uh, I might have some in time for Thanksgiving harvest. So I direct seeded into the boxes, and as I mentioned earlier, you can space them pretty closely. So you can see these little seedlings are coming up fairly close. Uh, these are most of the, we'll talk about varieties in a bit, the brassicas, this row here, it was spinach, I didn't get as many plants, and, and we'll come back and we'll see, we'll see, I think it's this little spinach plant, uh, when I finally harvested it in, in March, but this was that bed in uh, end of September, and by November, you can see fully ready and harvestable, and I had done a little bit of thinning, uh, and eaten just thrown into salads, some of the smaller ones, but I didn't do a lot of thinning. And uh, they, they still came in and were a fine size and readily edible. Uh, I even used smaller containers. So this, I think I got at Rite Aid. It's just one of these plastic square tubs. It's just five inches wide. It's two feet long. It's seven and a half inches deep and the soil level is probably even closer to seven inches. So itty bitty, and you can see it is chock full. I'll talk more about what's growing in there. These are Tokyo turnips as well as um, some green onions. So not a lot of space. And I got probably about three meals worth of vegetables out of, uh, out of that, that little container. So I'm going to talk some about the types of aging grains with, as I said earlier, an emphasis on the ones that Mimi and I planted. So uh, you see green mizuna a lot. I know they sell it like in bulk. People do use it in salads, as I mentioned, the baby plants. Uh, we planted a pink mizuna, which is a really pretty color. And I think some additional nutrients uh, come along with that color. And then we grew three kinds of bok choy, one called yellow heart, that's kind of this crinkly one. And the center often would be a slightly lighter color than the dark outside leaves. That's how it's named yellow heart. Uh, Sujo baby, which is just a traditional bok choy, uh, small one, a baby size one, and one called purple lady, which was also a small one. And this is my um, ones I grew in the fall. And then as I said, you saw the second box I planted. So in the spring, uh, I had uh, just the, the bok choys in the same varieties, the yellow heart, you can see it's a, more of a yellow color here. Uh, the Sujo baby and the purple, I got fewer purple ones and they also went to seed earlier. You can see some little flowers there, uh, perfectly edible. So we also grew uh, Chinese kale or uh, also called Chinese broccoli. So we grew, uh, uh, I think the uh, uh, Kailan variety and the Wan Chen. And so this is Chinese broccoli being prepared um, for a stir fry. We grew two kinds of flowering brassicas, one called early green and late green. That's this one over here. Um, we'll see a picture later. Mimi grew uh, gai choy, Chinese mustard. I grew mibuna or uh, mustard spinach, which is a Japanese mustard. So these are the mibuna uh, plants. Uh, and you can see why people would call it a mustard spinach. It looks, looks a lot like spinach. I have my hand in the picture just so you get a sense of the size of the leaves. I pick the baby leaves to put in salad. And then as the plant matured, I use the older leaves. Um, I think we'll see a picture actually when we get into cooking in, uh, in a stir fry. And back to those turnips that I mentioned, if you're wrinkling your nose because you remember mashed turnips 
when you were a kid and your mother made you eat them, or maybe she mixed some mashed potatoes in them, but the taste of turnips makes, makes you wrinkle your nose. Um, these are a almost like, um, if you could think of the texture of a radish, but not the bite of a radish, but the sweetness. And so uh, there's a variety called Haruki or Tokyo Cross. I started seeing them at the Marin Farmer's Market and fell in love with them. They're really tender and you can eat both the greens as well as the, the root piece. And what I do is I slice the roots and stir fry them and throw the greens in right at the end to steam. And they're smiling, not just because they're with their, their grandmother, but they actually love them and they came in and helped me cook them. So, I mean, if you can get, you can get kids to say, grandma, can we go pick more turnips? You know, you know you're growing something that's going to be tasty. Uh, that little tiny spinach I pointed out to you, that's it the day that I harvested it. So you can see that it took a lot longer. I was pretty much done. There are no you know, no, no cabbages, uh, brassicas, bok choy is left in that box, but the spinach was still growing. Uh, and so at the end of March, uh, it was, it's the sweetest spinach I've ever eaten. And this is the variety called Anna. And then there were some other varieties uh, that I saw when I was looking for uh, Asian spinach varieties. So stepping away from the brassicas, so all of those that, that I kept saying brassicas you might be familiar with are like uh, broccoli or kale or cabbage or mustard, including like the field mustard that you see growing in the vineyards are all in the brassica family. Uh, these are some Asian greens that are not in the brassica family. Some of you may be aware that the tender leaves of pea shoots, the pea plant, are edible and can also be quickly stir fried, just takes like three minutes to cook them. And there are some varieties uh, specifically grown for the shoot rather than the mature peas. And the one that we grew was called maple. And then it's a bit of a stretch, but they are green and they're certainly used in, uh, in Asian cooking, are bunching onions. And these we, uh, we grew from seed. And uh, this was the variety, the evergreen white nibukas. And um, the ones I didn't harvest actually went to seed. I harvested some seeds and I still have a few in the pot that are perfectly edible. So I'm still harvesting these almost, almost a full year later. And then we branched out and tried a few herbs as well, just because by then we were having fun and wanting to uh, be curious and see, see what else we could grow that would go with our greens. So at this point in time, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Mamie. I'll mute myself. And uh, Mamie's going to talk about the growing of Asian greens. So take it away, Mamie. Okay. Um, I'm sorry if there's a barking dog in the distance. Um, there's nothing I can do about that. But anyway, um, we're going to be, when we're talking about growing Asian greens, we're talking about those in the brassica family. So that's the mustard or coal family. And maybe you've grown, you know, as Bonnie said, broccoli and cabbage. Um, and kale. Uh, these plants, uh, you can grow a lot more of them in, in the same amount of space that you do these other plants. So um, for the site, the fall is really the ideal time to plant these since most of them are cold weather plants. So you need to plant in a sunny location sheltered from the wind. Um, and it's okay if you still have them in the ground when it freezes, because just like kale sweetens, um, some of these uh, adult plants will also sweeten a little because of the sulfur uh, in the leaves. So um, in the spring, uh, you can plant in light shade, except for gylon and the warm weather brassicas, which like the sun. Um, you shouldn't plant where other brassicas have been planted in the last three years. And it's kind of a challenge for those of us with small gardens, but this is to avoid disease and pests. And the, the photo here is of a Japanese mustard, the Kamasuta tender green. 
So the next slide, please. Okay, so the soil should be um, not too acidic, not too uh, alkaline. So, you know, kind of in the middle there. Um, because the, uh, you see you have the uh, big leafy greens, but really shallow roots. So it's really important to have rich, moist, well-drained soil with lots of nitrogen to get that nice leafy greens. Um, and you can get that by working uh, two inches of compost into the top two inches, I mean, top six inches. Um, and, and then if it is too uh, alkaline, you can add lime. I'm, I'm sorry, it's just the opposite. You can add lime if it's too acidic. All right, and the photo we have here is gai choy, which is the Chinese mustard. Okay, um, so planting. Um, as Bonnie had said, late summer through fall, you can direct uh, sow the seeds um, in mid to late summer um, for late, late summer and fall uh, harvest, a quarter to half inch deep, uh, three to four inches apart with the final spacing six to 12 inches. And that's depending on what variety you grow. Um, but you, you can bunch them as, as Bonnie had said, because in thinning them, you can use the thinning uh, plants. Okay, in the spring, uh, which is February through April, you plant indoors before the last frost in cell packs or soil blocks um, because they don't like the, the roots to be disturbed. And then you can plant them out four weeks later, or you can direct sow as Bonnie did. Um, in the ground. And this is a photo of baby, uh, sujo baby, which are baby sujo babies, and it's a bok choy. All right, so care. One of the things about these plants is they do bolt, and bolting is when it, uh, the plants go to flower or um, seed prematurely. Um, but, but these plants you usually can eat anyway after they bolt. So, um, but, but once they go to seed, then, then it's really harder to, to deal with them. So, um, so you, uh, you don't want cold weather, you don't want poor soil, you don't want it too cold, you don't want it too hot. Um, so you need to keep the weeds down since they're uh, shallow rooted plants. You don't wanna to have too much competition. And um, watering, you should water as regularly as you can in these times of drought, um, because they do grow fast and they do stay tender. Um, and remember the shallow roots. Uh, so to keep them well moist, um, you should mulch to retain the water and to keep the weeds down. And this is a flowering brassica, uh, which is also called yu choy, and it's the early green. And this one is grown uh, so that you eat the flowers and the stalks, all right? So the pests of these uh, Asian greens are the same pests that of the mustard family. So aphids, the first photo here is Bonnie's plant that has some aphids on it. So you know you can um, spray that with water and if it's really persistent, you, you might wanna use insecticidal soap. Um, Cabbage loopers, which are, um, I think, and uh, cabbage loopers and the imported cabbage worm, those you can hand pick. Um, the cabbage maggot, uh, you can, root maggot, you can wrap the stem uh, with paper. Uh, cut worms, you can make protective um, rings from toilet paper rolls or paper towel rolls to to protect the stem. Um, earwigs, uh, that one you need to, uh, they come out at night and as do the snails and slugs. So you, for both of those, you can uh, create traps um, and, uh, you know, with rolled paper, newspaper or um, bamboo and collect them and then, you know, put them in soapy water. Um, for earwigs also, uh, you need to uh, clean the area around them so that there's no place for them to hide. And snails and slugs, you can uh, handpick those, you can trap them as I said, 
and you can put up barriers of copper or uh, dioecious earth. Um, so the diseases that they, you might face are powdery mildew. Um, Bonnie said that she had some powdery mildew towards the end of the season, so she just ended up pulling the plant out. Um, so, you know, uh, or you could use neem oil um, if you want to preserve the plant. Um, clubfoot is a fungus that remains in the soil. One of the reasons you want to rotate your crops and um, you can avoid that if you use um, proper handling of the seedlings. Uh, okay, and these, this photo at the bottom are my gylon and um, I used eggshells, which I understand is really not an effective way, obviously. And I also use sluggo. Um, so, and you know, in this one, I remembered that I put up um, a bird net because <laughs> I had lost all of my seedlings in the fall because of birds, because I had made seedlings and cell packs and left them on this table. And I thought they were doing fine until you know, I looked out a week later and, and they were gone because of um, those pesky birds. So this, I, when I planted these seedlings in the soil in the spring, I did put over um, some, some bird net nets. So I don't think these were birds this time. And I never really discovered what they were, but I think that have it, had, had I used row, row covers, floating row covers, maybe that, or, or um, um, a cold frame, I would have saved these plants, okay? So just um, to sum up, um, you need, for pests and diseases, you need to use good cultural practice. And that means, you know, planting in the right spot, um, watering them regularly if you can, weeding, um, and, uh, and then you need to monitor your plants to make sure, you know, to see what is, is eating them, if something is eating them or if there's a disease. And um, then you can, you, you can protect the seedlings with cold frames or floating row covers. Um, you can use a multiple of these, uh, use several of these uh, ways to protect your plants. But one thing that you should probably really try not to do in a home garden is to use insecticides. And the reason is, is that, um, you know, the insecticides are gonna get into the water or to, if they stay in your, your, your soil. But also there are, um, there are predators of these pests that you don't want to kill with insecticides and parasites of these pests. So there are natural predators and natural parasites that will um, attack these pests. Okay, the next slide. So if you have any question, you can always go to our website, marinmg.ucanr.edu, and you can go to our problem garden problem page. And right there, you can see uh, aphids, I think, and uh, earwigs, and that'll give you all the information that you need for the, the pests, in, pests in your garden. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so here, you can look up earwigs, describes the problem, and then it tells you what you can do. All right. So harvesting Asian greens, you pretty much can harvest them at any stage. Um, the outer leaves, the flower stalks or shoots of gylon or the choisum, or the whole plant, like in bok choy. And in fact, when you harvest the whole plant, if you leave an inch or two, just like with lettuce, there's a chance that that those leaves will regenerate and you'll have uh, more, more leaves to harvest. Um, okay, so they, you can store them a few days in a plastic bag in your refrigerator. Um, I remember on a trip to China in Harbin, uh, it was in November, I believe, and you, you could see people storing their Chinese cabbages in their windowsills all over town. Okay, and this is a photo of Gai Choy, the Chinese mustard. So just a little bit about hydroponics. Um, hydroponics is growing plants without soil in water and with nutrients. 
And the nutrients can, uh, here's this system here where the nutrients are pumped in the water. Um, there are also foliar, foliar nutrients that you can use, but here the pump pumps the water, it keeps the water circulating um, and keeps the uh, plants nourished and uh, hydrated. So, uh, the, you know, hydroponics has been used commercially to grow lots of fruits and vegetables. And in fact, we learned that most of the berries that you buy in the grocery store are grown hydroponically. Um, so, uh, so some people do it as a hobby, as did Vicki, our colleague here. And the benefits of using hydroponics is that you can grow a lot in less space. You get a big yield. Um, it takes less water uh, with fewer plants, um, and you can grow these plants year round. So um, some people grow them outdoors. Most grow them in greenhouses. Um, and uh, let's see, but you have to, <laughs> takes more te technical skill because you need to know how much nutrients to put in, that's how much water, that sort of thing. So, um, so with that, let's see how Vicki did with growing her Asian greens. So her second attempt with bok choy and early brassicas, these are in two inch net pops was pots was more successful. So, um, and then the next one, she was even more successful with Chinese broccoli and um, her Chinese pea shoots germinated, but were lost in the cold snap. So you can see she's doing her uh, hydroponic growing outdoors. Okay. Some ways to prepare Asian greens. So one of the easiest ways is Chinese broccoli with oyster sauce. So this, all you do is blanch your Chinese broccoli and use oyster sauce that you can buy at most grocery stores in the Asian food section. Um, and so you just blanch it, you take it out of the water, put a little oyster sauce on it and you can serve it. Um, so my mother would take, when I was growing up, my mother would take bok choy and we had a clothesline and she would, she would line it up on the clothesline and dry up uh, several plants so that throughout the winter, we would have soup from the dried bok choy that she cooked with a little pork. Okay, and Bonnie's gonna talk about some ways that she prepares Asian okay. greens. Thanks, Amy. So uh, you heard Mimi mention oyster sauce. So I find it's a really, it's, it's kind of like the perfect flavor to go with the bite of uh, mustardy or you know cabbagey kinds of things, and these are these were the Japanese mustard that I grew, and I just quickly stir fried them with some mushrooms, and then the the little dumplings uh, were just from Costco, and I threw those in right at the end and and put the top on, and it's they were flavored with the oyster sauce, and then I do a lot of stir fries. So in one of those pictures, you saw that big green. Uh, harvest basket that was full of vegetables. So you can see I just cut them up, threw them all in together uh, with just, I think I used peanut oil for this and just quickly stir fried them. And I'll either use uh, soy sauce on them or Easter sauce. I think uh, there's some little bits of ginger I had chopped up and put in there. But uh, they cook very quickly, which is, uh, which is nice when you haven't thought about what you're gonna have for dinner and suddenly, Everybody's hungry. So our main two seed sources were Kitazawa Seed Company and the Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds, um, you know, which you can order online. Um, so, but other sources are Renee's Garden, Johnny Seeds, Burpees, and Territorial Seeds. So we all- We're both online, right? You can get them all online. I think all the seeds you can get yeah, online. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so we um, <laughs> tried some Asian herbs and I took the easy route here by um, buying ginger from the grocery store. And I stuck it in water until I got some uh, nodules, I think they were nodules expanding there. And um, so then I stuck it in, in potting soil 
and you can see I got some some uh, leaves here. And um, after a couple months of having it on my um, in my window sill, I I planted it outdoors. But I wasn't as successful. Once I planted it outdoors, the the leaves died back. So then I thought, oh, it must be ready to harvest. But when I dug it up, it did create one extra nodule more than I had before. But um, I guess I should have left it in longer. But I had more success with the lemongrass that I bought at the grocery store. So I bought lemongrass, two different ones, and I stuck them in water. And it took about a month or so, I think, for roots to um, show up. And then once they did, I put them in planting soil and left them on my windowsill again for a couple of months. And um, so I planted them outdoors between my tomato plants. And look how it how they how it did. The only problem is is that we have somebody who does our maintenance, and he thought it was a weed, and he pulled it out. So I didn't get to I didn't get to use my lemongrass or Bonnie's either. I was going to give a plant to her. <laughs> So I was the one who experimented with uh, Thai basil. I grow Italian basil, Genovese basil, uh, in pots on a balcony that's outside our kitchen door. And I thought, well, it's just another kind of basil. So I planted Thai basil from seed, and I've done this two years in a row now, and it does really well. It's still, uh, my plants outside are still big and healthy. and. Uh, after it flowers, you still have plenty of leaves. Sometimes after Italian basil flowers, the, the leaves sort of get too tough, but it's quite edible and, uh, and really wonderful. And the flowers attract a lot of bees as well. So sort of making the bees happy. And I also grow cilantro and uh, Cilantro, I think probably a lot of people are aware that the same herb that's the dried coriander seed that's used in uh, pickling and uh, uh, different kinds of Indian uh, cookery, if you plant the seeds, the leaves have a very different and distinct flavor and they're what's known as cilantro. And uh, I find it's pretty easy to grow and in any kind of warm weather, it is the first thing that will bolt. I mean, it can be a very young plant. It might have only gotten three leaves, but when it gets hot, it just says, oh, I'm going to make flowers. I got to get my seeds up. So I just continually replant it. Uh, in the winter, I have a lot more luck. I can keep it around a lot longer. But uh, the, the problem of it going to seed also is the solution for if you have to plant it regularly, uh, you can harvest your own seed and continually plant it. So I haven't bought uh, cilantro seed for uh, five years. I'm just using the, the seeds that it's growing itself. Go back to you for the onions. Okay, here are some bunching onions. These are Bonnie's bunching onions. Um, hers. Uh, this is after they seeded and grew. So hers are, are nice and young and tender. Mine, I put into um, my raised bed and here they are um, pretty mature, but, uh, and now they think they've gone to seed. So I'm gonna see if they'll seed, but um, yeah, they're very easy to grow. And over a long period of time, you could uh, be harvesting these bunching up onions. So in summary, their e Asian greens are easy and fast growing, eight to 12 days for pea shoots, 30 to 55 days for flowering brassicas or yaw choy, 40 to 60 days for gai choy, the uh, Chinese mustard, um, 60 to 70 days for the Chinese broccoli. And you can put a lot of plants in the same uh, area that you're putting your broccoli and getting a lot more uh, meals out of that than your broccoli plant. So they're good cool weather crops, um, except for the flowering brassicas, which like the, the warm weather. You can grow them in the garden, as I did, in containers, as Bonnie did, or hydroponically, as our friend Vicki did. Um, they're very nutritious, high in vitamin C and K, folate, calcium, potassium, phosphorus, etc., and very low in calories. 
uh, Bonnie was saying that 12 calories per cup, but 60 calories in a pound. Not many things have just 60 calories in a pound. They do to cook down though. So they're quick and easy to cook. You can do them in stir fries. You can do them in salads. You can put them in soups. Um, many ways of cooking these Asian greens and very delicious too. So do we have any questions? And so, Sariana, you are going to uh, deal with that. I think I'm going to stop my screen share. If we need to go back to a picture, and we'll restart it. Yeah, there are oh, there are some questions in the chat. So let's go to those first, and then we can do more of a traditional Q and A. If anybody has questions in the chat, you if anybody has questions, you'd like to type into the chat. Go for it now, um, or uh, we can wait and do a raised hand thing. Um, so Yoon asks. Can I make an appointment these days during the pandemic? I think they met with the um, through the Marine Master Gardeners. So, so yes. So for the water walks, just go to the website, click on water walks, and you can schedule an appointment there. So they, yeah, you'll get uh, folks are very busy, but uh, this is a good time to do it now that it started raining. Uh, folks may be a little shy, thinking the drought's over. So hop in line. Yeah, and then so Lise asks, can you cut and come again with Asian greens? So maybe why don't you address that since you did a little bit in your talk? Yes, you can. Um, so yeah, give it a try. Leave, you know, one or two inches um, and see what will grow. Now, I think if you're doing ya choy or uh, daisam or ya choy, there you're cutting the stalk and the flower stalk. So you probably wouldn't get ex that wouldn't grow again. But your bok choy, your um, and uh, you know uh, gailon probably you could give it a try. Great, thank you. Um, Lisa also has another uh, question. I have a bird problem also. If the plants are larger, are the birds more likely to leave them alone? Are they more likely to leave Asian greens alone versus other usual greens? Well, I don't know. I wouldn't take a chance. I actually, you know, I have a, a raised bed, so it's easier for me to cover it with bird, bird netting. So um, I don't know if that's possible for me or not. What would you say, Bonnie? Yeah, so I, I also have a huge bird problem. So the one, my, my biggest caution is if you want to grow peas, either for eating or to grow the green from peas, Birds are voracious and they really will attack them. Once the plants get large enough, you're safe. The, the, the leaves aren't as tender or they're at least sturdy enough to stand up to occasional nibbling. I have found now I have, uh, I use container planting and the boxes that I use for most of them are raised. They're about three feet off the ground, kind of sink like tubs. Uh, and I was not having bird problems with the Asian greens. I, the ones I just replanted even, they're like tiny seedlings and, uh, and the birds are leaving them alone. Maybe it helped that it rained and there are some green grasses, but I don't, I don't think they like the taste of the cabbage plants. Uh, certainly if there's a choice between peas and cabbage, yeah. I, uh, I haven't covered them during the summer. I had not Asian greens, but um, arugula, which is also in the brassica family. And the birds were going after that. And that's got a real strong flavor. So, but once they get bigger, you're safe. Thank you. Um, Yoon has another question. Where's the best place to buy seeds? I think you guys kind of touched on that though. Is that correct? Right? Like I, yeah. I, I saw the yeah. buy online, I'm like, ooh. <laughs> Right. Yeah, Kitasawa yeah. is actually in Oakland, and I know you can mail order their seeds. Uh, Harmony, some people go out to Harmony uh, for garden supplies, and Harmony actually, I know, stocks their seeds. So they're, they're one I like, although as master gardeners, uh, we really can't endorse or make specific recommendations. So I suppose I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll cover that logo up, right? And just, we're recording, we're recording. Uh -oh. <laughs> We gave, several, we gave several sources, actually. So Kitazawa, Baker Creek, uh, 
yeah. Johnny seeds, burpees, territorial seeds. So, yeah. We don't yeah, have Johnny's them. actually, uh, I, I was on their website recently and was amazed how many varieties of Asian greens they have. Okay, thank you. Danielle asks, is it too <laughs> late to oh. <laughs> uh, Danielle asks, is it too late to plant from seed now? Also, my raised beds have no direct sun in the winter, though it is open shade, shaded by the house, but out in the open and very light. Will that work with Asian greens? I grew kale, chard, and lettuces very successfully last winter there. I think you're set, especially if you grew kale and where I've got mine in the winter, it gets very little light. And as I said, I just planted a week and a half ago. So it's still now's a good time because that was my question. I actually wrote it down and then I saw Danielle's question. I'm like, I'm going to wait. So it's okay to still uh, plant right now? Yeah, you can plant right now. Awesome. All right. Lavinia asks, my cilantro near my tree kale does not grow well uh, in Novato. Is cilantro better in container and what nutrients or fertilizer does cilantro, cilantro like? Yeah, uh, I only grow it in containers. I think it likes a pretty rich soil and lots of moisture. So um, I'm trying to think if I've ever, I, I guess I have put some seeds in the garden. I find the ones in containers do better. Maybe that I pay more attention to them. I don't know, Mimi, are you also growing cilantro? So well, you I, the ground it, gardening. I grew it in the past, but I did it in a container. But the thing with cilantro, it's just what you said. It just goes to seed so quickly. There's such a short, um, I guess, yeah, it's, it's just such a short growing period on that. Yeah, try a container. Yeah, it doesn't have to be very big. I think I have like just a three gallon container. I have two of those, so it's not big. And then I have a, you know, a commercial, uh, you know, organic soil mix from one of the, uh, one of the growers. Um, Lavinia asks, uh, do you use regular potting soil? Yes, I did. I just use regular potting soil. Well, I use, well, I don't want to say the, well, I use happy frog. I think that's what it was. So, so a pretty rich, uh, you know, uh, nutritious. Yeah, happy frog, Edna's best, ocean forest. Mm -hmm. And there's even a, there's even a 420 one that, you know, they might look at you dubiously wondering if you're growing something. Well, it's legal to grow now, but um, but it, it, it actually is also a, a pretty rich soil. Yeah, I use that for potting tomatoes. Great, thank you. That's it so far in the chat. I'm going to um, stop recording for now. So I'm going to stop recording. We'll stay open for a little longer.